from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast, where we also veer off the serial killer path to delve into other topics within our beloved true crime community. This week's podcast will be on a man that refers to himself as John of God. His real name is Joao Teixeira de Feria. I'm sure I butchered that. I apologize. He was born on June 24th, 1942 in what is now known as Cachoeira de Goiás, Brazil. So let's get into some history for that time. At this point, the United States had joined World War II. Car manufacturers had to make the switch to make war materials. The minimum draft age was lowered from 21 years old to 18 years old for males. Gasoline was rationed to just three gallons a week. The Declaration of the United Nations was signed by 26 nations this year. It laid the foundation for what would become the United Nations organization after the end of the war. Italian physicist Enrico Fermi created the first nuclear chain reaction in his lab at the University of Chicago. Some other notable people that were born the same year were Jimi Hendrix, Harrison Ford, Jerry Garcia, Stephen Hawking, Robert Picton, a serial killer, John Wayne Gacy, also a serial killer, and Joe Biden. So this was the atmosphere that Joao was born into, though I will now continue to call him John. As far as his early life, John was the oldest child of six born to Jose and Francisca. Jose, his father, owned a laundry service and was also a skilled tailor. Francisca was a homemaker, but eventually began running a small hotel in the tiny town that they lived in. John went to primary school, and it was said that he was eventually kicked out due to his disciplinary issues. As a result, he never learned to read or write. But he did go work with his father cutting fabric for the tailoring business. So when John was nine years old, he was visiting some family in a nearby village. He exclaimed, really predicted, that a storm was going to come that day and that it would be very destructive. He was of course blown off as the weather had been quite nice that day, but just as he had said, a storm hit and it wound up destroying 50 homes. He later said this had been his quote, first big glimpse of his gift, unquote. After this occurred, he began taking money from people to predict specific things for them. He even began telling villagers to take different herbs to treat different illnesses. Seven years this went on, and as John saw that there just weren't any real job opportunities he was qualified for, he decided to leave and travel around Brazil in search of work. Now, as one might guess, he was very hungry and suffering from exhaustion when 16-year-old John stopped at a creek to get a drink and bathe himself. He was approached by none other than a saint, Saint Rita to be exact, and they sat and chatted for the better part of the afternoon. She advised him to, quote, love and believe in a higher being, unquote. So the next morning, John walked back to the water where he said he saw a pillar of light where St. Rita had been the day before. He said he heard her tell him to go to the Spiritist Center of Christ, the Redeemer, which wasn't very far away. 
Once he arrived, he said he fainted. So I think really this is a good place as any to stop and kind of look at his childhood, okay? So now it's pretty clear that he came from humble means, but with his father owning a laundry and tailor shop and his mother running a small hotel, I just have a hard time believing that he really went without as far as life necessities. There was absolutely no mention of abuse or neglect, and in fact, it was pretty obvious that his parents were good influences and in that they taught him about having a work ethic and so on. And yet, he was a pretty severe troublemaker at school, so much so that he had to be expelled. Now, this can go a few different ways. Were his parents not disciplining him, as in teaching him how to control his impulses as parents do? And if not, were there no consequences? Or perhaps they were doing what normal parents do and he continued to behave in such a manner that the school had to expel him. What would this say about his behavior at home or possibly toward his siblings? We might be looking at a conduct disorder or possibly an oppositional defiance disorder. Now I am not diagnosing, but I am speculating. So what do I mean by a conduct disorder? Okay, so conduct disorder is a group of behavioral and emotional problems that usually begin in childhood or adolescence. These kids have a hard time following established rules and controlling themselves in a socially acceptable way. They show aggression, destructive patterns, and deceitful behavior that often violate the rights of others. There are three types of conduct disorders. There's childhood onset, adolescent onset, and unspecified onset, which really just means it couldn't be determined whether it was early childhood or adolescent onset. Now, children with conduct disorder have very limited prosocial emotions and are often described as callous and unemotional, which matches future behaviors that you will hear about soon enough. So we know that his behavior was unacceptable, that he was expelled and never really learned how to read and write. Illiteracy is also a pretty big deal. So with no education, being illiterate, he would be forced to work with his father in the family business as those would be the only practical skills that he would have at that time. And then he got his big break when he was nine years old. So he stated that a storm was coming to a neighboring village and as the villagers looked up, conditions didn't seem to favor his statement. But as we all know, weather prediction is a fickle thing. And little John got lucky in that a storm did blow through, which was described as pretty severe. But I want to add that in this area, people were followers of spiritism. So let's dive into that. According to the World Religions and Spirituality Organization, Spiritist Doctrine says that there is a primal, causal agent and intelligence, aka God. There are also spirits that have the capacity and goal of perfecting themselves through reincarnation over a number of lifetimes, and they believe spirits can communicate with the living as well as intervene in their lives. As humans, spiritism teaches we are actually immortal spirits that temporarily inhabit any mortal, physical bodies in search of moral and intellectual improvement. At the same time, spirits can also have damaging effects on their human hosts, creating mental imbalance. So each spirit has free will and retains its unique identity across its numerous reincarnations. In each lifetime, the spirit accumulates positive and negative karma as a product of the morality of its actions that shapes its evolution. For these people, spiritism offered a kind of understanding of the relationship between spirits and humans. 
So spiritism subsequently gained a substantial following, particularly in the middle classes, with over 2 million followers over the years. There are more than 12,000 spiritist centers throughout Brazil that together draw tens of millions of Brazilians, which was introduced to Brazil in the late 1800s. So with all of this in mind, this is how John set himself up as a sort of spiritist influencer, if you will. He then used this as proof that he was, I guess you could say, one of the enlightened beings being possessed with spirits that took people's money to predict other things or cure ailments. His success rate was, of course, incredibly low, but people nonetheless believed him to be powerful and kept coming as customers. But we must assume that people caught on because he then began traveling around Brazil again looking for work. And then at 16, he has this vision of St. Rita who bestowed upon him the knowledge that he must believe in a higher being and instructed him to go to a nearby spiritist center. So let's get back into the story. So as I had said, once he reached his destination, he fainted. When he awoke, he later said he was surrounded by people who told him that he had been possessed by the King of Solomon and had been performing, quote, surgeries for several hours. He was then taken to the center director's home for some rest and food. And then reportedly at the request of King Solomon, of course, who was then possessing his body. Let's remember the next day he began performing surgeries just as he had done the day before. So, um, you're probably asking yourself, what kind of surgeries? There is a video on YouTube of this man performing his surgeries, and I'll leave the link in the notes below. Disclaimer, disclaimer, it is tough to watch, and I'm about to describe it here, but I highly recommend you watch it if you have the stomach for it. It appears that he takes a scalpel or small, what kind of looks like cuticle scissors and makes cuts in various areas on the person. Sometimes he inserts these scissors inside of a person's nostril and then he snips at the tissue repeatedly in their nose or has them open their mouth as he uses a scalpel and slices the back of the person's mouth or throat. One guy was just gargling his own blood. He also does this on other parts of the body as well. One man in particular who John would later perform a surgery on was wheeled away in his wheelchair, blood already pouring out of his nose and pooling on his shirt. So as time went along, the young man experienced what he called spiritual instruction from many entities who consciously guided his hands, so to speak, in his early stage of his career as a healer. He was often called John the Medium or John the Healer. He again began to travel around Brazil, jumping at opportunities for food and clothing, shelter or money in exchange for his healing talents. Now this of course did not go unnoticed and many area medical professionals and religious leaders spoke out about his fraudulent activities. He was arrested for practicing medicine without a license. Now there was a revolution in Brazil that happened in 1962 and the now 20 year old John joined the military and worked as a tailor for several years. He did keep a relatively low profile until one day, he somehow successfully treated a doctor's leg that had been injured, or so he always said. After this incident, he began offering his healing services to other military personnel as well as their families. The benefit was that he was able to pick back up where he left off, practicing medicine without a license, but this time with the backing of the military. 
any time that he would be arrested or almost persecuted for practicing medicine without a license, it would immediately be dropped. So in 1978, the now 36-year-old John traveled to a small town not far from where he was originally from and rented a small building located beside the city's main road. There, he offered his healing magic to people who came to him with various ailments. He would sit outside in a chair and people came in droves to have him heal them. Some even began to stay to basically work for John. He advertised himself as a medium who is, quote, incorporated by deceased physicians who work through him to affect physical and emotional healing. Yes, possessed by past physicians. So as you can imagine, it wasn't long before he was treating hundreds of people a day and raised enough money to open a dedicated center. It was at this point that he took on the title of John of God. In 1981, John was arrested and put on trial for practicing medicine without a license, but the outpouring of public support led to an acquittal on the charge. So with all of this money he was making, he continued to buy land around his healing center and in a nearby village that he said were being used as cattle farms and for mining minerals. And I couldn't immediately find the dates nor who their mother or mothers were, but John did go on to have three children, two daughters and one son. But what people didn't fully realize was that he was also farming babies and selling them for money. You see, it is reported that he would offer money to very low income girls between the ages of about 14 to 18 to go and live on one of the mineral mines or farms that he owned. There they would effectively become sex slaves and would be forced to get pregnant and their babies would then be immediately taken from them to be sold to the highest bidder from other continents. In exchange for food and shelter, they were impregnated and their babies sold on the black market. Now recently people have claimed that they bought Brazilian babies from John of God for as much as $50,000. An investigator said, Quote, we have received reports from the adoptive mothers of their children that we sold for between twenty and fifty thousand dollars in Europe, the United States, and Australia, as well as testimony from ex workers and local people who are tired of being complicit with John of God's gang. Unquote. And then one of John's own daughters came forward stating that she was a victim of her father's crimes. She said that under the pretense of him performing his mystical treatments on her, he abused and raped her between the ages of 10 and 14 years old. She claimed he stopped after she became pregnant by one of his employees, after which her father beat her so severely that she suffered a miscarriage. She described her father as a monster. Another witness came forward stating that the women who were forced to give birth again and again were murdered after 10 years of giving birth, though I couldn't find any really reliable sources to back that particular claim up. Nonetheless, he was able to keep this secret enough that he was able to continue these practices for many years. Thousands of people from all over the world would come to take part in his healing and surgeries. He did come up with a product that he sold in pill form, but only with a prescription from him, of course, can you get it. That would take care of just about any illness that you had, from cancer to cystic fibrosis to depression. If you watch the video I link below, the substance inside the pills was tested and turned out to be nothing more than passion flower. So I looked this up because I can subscribe to herbal remedies being okay under certain specific conditions. 
The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services states that passion flower, which is a quite beautiful vining flower, I might add, has been studied, albeit not extensively. The research suggests that it might help reduce non-specific anxiety and anxiety before a surgical or dental procedure, but the conclusions were nowhere near definite. There is also not enough evidence to prove passion flower has any other helpful benefits. However, when not taken in excessive amounts, it isn't believed to be harmful. What it does not do is cure cancer or make genetic diseases just cure themselves and disappear. John of God also sells water that he is blessed and a bunch of other stuff. In 2005, the American Broadcasting Corporation's or ABC's program Primetime aired a one-hour special on John of God's compound. They talked about very sick people flocking to his compound, seeking out his healing and cures. There was very obviously a group of what I would guess to be handlers that work diligently to show that the business that is John of God is thriving. That they perpetuate the mythology surrounding him and taking people's money while booking hotels, selling tours of the, at least at that time, ever-growing compound. They aggressively push his trinkets and charms and will sell nearly anything if people will believe that it will help them. The tour itself can cost thousands of dollars and the hotel stays only start at two weeks. ABC interviewed a man by the name of James Randi who said, quote, I was filmed by ABC television for this special to offer my opinions and observations. They indicated that they wanted a skeptical point of view on these, quote, miracles, and I had already seen a videotape prepared and distributed by the organization in Brazil that touted John's abilities. Little evidential information was in the video except that some of the common tricks and misleading claims made by this organization were there to be clearly seen and revealed. Unquote. It would appear that many believed the ABC special failed to truly show just how bad this man and his organization was. Then, a few years later, Oprah herself began speaking highly of the healer. She dedicated an episode of her show in 2010 where she visited him and she said she almost fainted during the quote, blissful encounter. She also wrote that she was overwhelmed by an experience of seeing him cut into the breast of a woman without anesthesia and that she left feeling, quote, an overwhelming sense of peace, unquote. So, of course, this fame took John across international borders to conduct international healing events. He went to the Omega Center in upstate New York once a year and also held four-day healing events in Western Europe. Four spiritual extensions, if you will, have been built in New Zealand and Australia. And yet more and more people started coming forward with claims of abuse. Several women first came forward stating that John had abused them when they had come to him for assistance and healing. A Dutch choreographer was one who said that she had visited him to be cured of the trauma of a previous sexual assault. John took her into a back room and made her handle the goods, so to speak. And once he had finished, he let her pick out a precious gemstone and then he blessed it. She subsequently did go back to him at some point where she said that he then raped her. She did not go back and she stated shame kept her quiet for years. And then more and more women began coming forward, over 200 to be exact, all stating they had been abused by him when they were seeking out his help and some had only been children when he assaulted them. Yes, my friends. 
prosecutors then asked for John to be arrested. Now, John, of course, professed his innocence immediately. His own son was also arrested in connection to trying to pay off witnesses for their silence. But after a week on the run, John was actually captured, and they found that he had allegedly withdrew $9 million from several bank accounts, leading police to believe that he had been planning to flee Brazil or hide the money in case of compensation claims. In the end, over 600 allegations were made against him in total in what prosecutors say could be the worst serial crimes case in Brazil's history. He was ultimately sentenced to 19 years in prison for assaulting four women. He is now 78 years old. After his arrest, Oprah said in a statement, quote, I empathize with the women now coming forward and I hope justice is served. Unquote. So I did some digging, and as I suspected, if John had had conduct disorder or even perhaps oppositional defiance disorder as a child, it greatly increases the risk of a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder and psychopathic personality as an adult. And it makes sense, right? So signs of psychopathic personality include socially irresponsible behavior, violating the rights of others, inability to distinguish right from wrong, having a hard time showing guilt or remorse, frequently lying, manipulating and hurting others, recurring problems with the law, superficial charm, aggressive behaviors, and so on. And to me, this fits John's lifestyle and behavior pretty well. But what do you think? Leave me a comment on Instagram at serial underscore killing. You can direct message me. You can leave a comment underneath this video and you can email me at serialkillinginstagram at gmail.com. Consider becoming a sponsor. Every little bit helps. The more, the more content I can bring you. And thank you so much guys for choosing me because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me and I am humbled. I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great day.